Hallelujah. You go ahead and be seated. You know, as you're, as you're being seated, one of the things I want to share with you about worship, and I know it's nothing new. I know you've heard this many times, but it bears repeating. What we just did was most likely the most important part of the service. Worship. Acknowledging Him, giving thanks to Him. And, and when you worship, you open your heart and your mouth. It's not just thought. You give thanks. See, see thanksgiving and praise is, is you giving. So we give first. Before we receive, we, we give first. The best way to be a receiver is to make yourself a giver first because as you give, you receive. In the same measure that you give, you receive. And when you give out of a full heart of gratitude and appreciation, what you do is you open your heart to receive more. And when you worship, you're acknowledging the goodness of God and you're focusing on answers and not so much problems. And you get your eyes on Him and off yourself. And what happens as you worship, worship prepares your heart to then receive the Word. And so the Word that comes into your heart finds place, has deep root, and then bears great fruit in your life. What I'm going to do right now is I'm a temporary preacher. As long as, as I am alive, which I plan on being alive longer, as long as I'm alive and on planet Earth, I'll continue to teach and preach. But there will come a day that I'll go to heaven and I won't be teaching or preaching anymore. But I will be doing one thing there that I still do here, and that's worship. I'm a temporary preacher, but I will be an eternal worshiper. So if you haven't yet gotten into worship, I encourage you, learn now because you're going to need it later. Because you're going to be standing before the King of Kings and you want to get warmed up. You want to know how to give thanks unto the Lord. Amen. And listen, when we talk about giving thanks and rejoice in the Lord always, you know, the Bible says in everything give thanks. It doesn't say for everything. Because there are some ugly things and some stupid things and unkind things that happen to us. I don't thank God for sickness or disease. I don't thank God for when people try to take advantage of me or do something ugly, but I do thank God for who he is. I give thanks unto him because he's good. See, I don't thank him for the bad. I thank him that in the middle of the bad, he's still good. So my focus and my rejoicing is on who he is, not my circumstance. My circumstance or my situation may be terrible. You know, if I'm in a storm, I'm not going to thank God for the wind and the waves. I'm going to thank God that Jesus is in my boat to see me through all the wind and the waves. Amen? Just don't let what's outside your boat get in your boat. Remember who's in your boat, Jesus. So I thank God that he's with me, that he's for me, that he's on my side. And so I give thanks unto him because he's good. Situation may be bad, but God's always good. I always have a reason to rejoice. Why? Because of who he is. Not what's going on, but because of who he is. And what that does, it causes you to get your focus off the natural and onto the eternal. Get your focus off the temporary and, and, and where things are real and because your temporary is going to change. And everybody beside Pastor Edwin said, amen. It's good to be here. Hallelujah. You know, I have... You, you, you guys sit down. You know, these people have really made it hard on me today. I want you to know, you too. You know, from the time that we installed Pastor Joe Sell and Mylene as lead pastors, and um, that was, uh, we did that right after I had surgery, and then Shadi and I went to the States. We came back last year. We were here for a period of time, but most of the time we were here, we were locked down. I mean, I mean, many times we had to sneak into church just to record. I can say that now because it's a different administration. <laughs> but we had to sneak into church and record and just speak to a, a, a camera. No, no congregation, no people. And even the, the 
installation service of Joe Sell and Mylene. We just had some staff in here. We didn't even, we weren't even able to share that with the congregation. So it's been two years since I have stood on this platform. This is my third service today. This is so wonderful. And there's people here. <laughs> That's wonderful. I hate preaching to cameras. I mean, I do it, but it's so nice to see people. Even though you're still hiding behind masks and it takes a discerning of spirits to know who's really here or a word of knowledge. And don't come up to me next week and say, you know, pastor, you didn't say hi to me when I waved at you. Well, I, can't, I don't know everybody behind the mask. And, uh, but it's good to be here. Sister Shani is not with me. She will, she's coming. Um, when, I don't know. I mean, Jesus said he's coming, but she'll come before Jesus, I believe. Um, but we have a situation. Uh, Ten years ago, when Shadi was going through cancer, her sister, Stacy, came in to stay with us. And while Shadi was going through her treatment and everything, and, and we wanted to do it here. We wanted to go through treatment. We wanted Shadi to be here while we were standing for her life. Uh, family wanted us to bring her to the States. We said, no, 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 no. We're going to stay here. Because we wanted to be in an environment of faith. We wanted to be surrounded. You know, we have family there, but there's more faith here. God bless my family in the States, but there's a whole lot more faith here. So we wanted to be with our spiritual family here, surrounded by an atmosphere of faith with people that would stand with us and pray with us and pray for us. And, and we went through it. Shadi went through it. And she's, I think, 10, 11 years cancer-free now. She's doing well. Praise God. And, uh, but her sister was here with us for a while, uh, and, and Shadi really appreciated that. Well, now her sister's husband, his name is Matt, and he's been diagnosed with um, a very serious stomach cancer. And so he had a port put in yesterday, and next week he begins chemotherapy. And if the chemotherapy does not do what needs to be done, then they're, they're telling him they're going to have to take out either certain portions or a major portion of his stomach, which is not, it's, it's just not good. And so I just want us to pray. You know, we prayed in the first two services, and I know you don't want to be left out. And so I want us to pray for Matt right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says, if two or more shall agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it shall be done for them by you, our Father which is in heaven. Your word says that he carried our sicknesses and our diseases. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Your word says, O oh, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Your word declares that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, today and forever, and that the name of Jesus is above every name of things in heaven and earth and beneath the earth. So, Father, we pray for Matt right now in the name of Jesus, knowing that healing is your will, and we take authority over cancer. We take authority over that sickness and disease and infirmity, and we command it to dry up and dissolve at the very root. I thank you for a touch of heaven. I thank you for the healing of God working in Matt's stomach in the name of Jesus. And I pray from this day forward, he begin to amend and recover and come to a place of complete wholeness. We take authority over that stomach cancer in Jesus' name and speak healing and health and wholeness to Matt in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 I appreciate that. I know Shadi wants to be there with her sister and just speak and just encourage her. They're really going through a very, very hard time. And as much as she appreciated Stacy being here, uh, she said, honey, can, I, I, I want to stay. I want to be with my sister. She's going through this challenge. And then also Shadi's mom is 95. She was in the hospital with two, for two weeks. She had MRSA, which is a very bad infection, and then she got out of the hospital, came home, and had COVID, you know, so that's not a good combination. And uh, she's going to be 95 in a, in, in a few months, and Shadi says, I, I really want to be with my sister and Matt and just 
encourage them. And as much as Shadi has been with me and traveled with me over all the years, and, and I need to make her happy. How many of you believe that husbands ought to help make their wives happy? Well, you know, that's the best response I've had all day. I said that in the second service, and no, I didn't get one amen. I'm going to give you one more chance. How many of you think that, that husbands really need to make sure that they help keep their wives happy? You guys have an anointing in here tonight. Well, let, let, me, let me get into my message of what I have in my heart. And Shadi told me, she goes, honey, I know you've been gone a long time. Don't ramble. Get to the point. Give place to the Holy Ghost and stop on time. I went, you're not going to be there. You'll never know. But she might be watching. I, I was here last week for NLCOM Sunday, and I was so blessed. Uh, uh, Pastor Paul and Heidi, thank you. Thank you for the way that you carry the heart of NLCOM, the way you carry it to, to the, the islands of the nation and the, the compassion that you show and the diligence and the faithfulness and, and, and just the hard work and the sweat and the inconvenience and the willing to do whatever it, take, whatever it takes. Uh, Pastor Edwin, I want to thank you for how you carried it and as you passed the baton to uh, Paul and Heidi, that you, 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 you ran faithfully, you, both you and Millet, and, and the diligence of your life. And, but Paul and Heidi, you're, oh, is that passing the baton? And anything else you want to give them? You want to give them some water, you know? You, um, but I appreciate. You see, NLCOM really carries the heart of new life. And and, and one of the things that blessed me as I saw people signing up is I saw people wanting to get involved. Because I believe when you get involved with NLCOM or you get involved in any area of the church, what you're doing is you're connecting to the heart of God. Anything that God is doing in these last days, He's doing through the church. You know, I heard one person, you know, sometimes I listen to people on, on the internet or TV and then I hear something foolish and I just have to change the channel. Uh, one person said, well, you know, God's re not really using the church anymore. And I thought, oh, I can't listen to, to foolish people. No, Jesus, Jesus said, I will build my church. The church is what he's using. I, the single greatest power on the earth today is a church filled with the love and the life of God, filled with the power of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. If there's anything that God is doing in these last days is he's building strong Holy Ghost churches that have the presence of God, the power of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the heart of God to bring change into the world. So when you make a decision to get involved, in, whether it's in Elcom, and as you give of your support to that, or you, you get involved in any area of the church, you are connecting to the heart of God. And this is really my message and where it's going today. Uh, in Elcom and getting involved with people is really in the very core of new life. The very first year of new life when we started, was also the very year of Mount Pinatubo. And uh, so, we, I mean, we didn't even have 100 people in church. A very young church, brand new, beginning church. And when the volcano blew, uh, through an opportunity that came our way, somebody blessed us with a large amount of money, most money that had come into new life. Like I said, we are a very young church. We're still meeting in a restaurant. And some money came in. And so we, we organized a trip up north to where all the people had been evacuated, and we took up hundreds and hundreds, hundreds, probably a couple thousand boxes that had mosquito nets, blankets, candles, matches, coffee, I mean food. We, we, we packaged up boxes, and, and, and at this very, very young church, we went up there. I remember I, was, I, had, <laughs> I had one brother with me. We went in, and we were laying hands on people and praying for people, and uh, as we were praying for this one lady, she told me what was wrong, and, and he didn't hear what she said, and I knew he didn't hear it, but I said, come on, let's pray for her. Let's speak healing and life over her. So we, we laid hands on her and prayed for her, and as we were praying for her, he whispered in my ear, he goes, what's her problem? I said, leprosy. He went, ho, ho, ro, ho, sha. I said, no, it, it's okay, because what's in us is greater than what's on her. <laughs> All of a sudden, he got a little. But whether it's been floods, landslides, typhoons, tsunamis, fires, volcanoes, or earthquakes, 
Now, I know it's more fun in the Philippines, but this is not fun. You know, I was sharing with somebody the things that Inelcom does, and when I gave them this list, they went, you don't have all that in the Philippines. I said, oh, yeah, we got it all. We got some things we don't want, but we still do. You know, we have a, a, a kitchen truck out there that will show up in different areas and can feed thousands of people. In fact, that truck is, is a one-of-a-kind truck. I don't know if there's another truck like it in the nation, but God blessed this church with it because we made a decision, Lord, we want to be used, and if, you, if you'll use us and... The, and See, when you position yourself, when you make yourself available, he'll give you whatever you need to get the job done because you're connecting with the heart of God. And see, that's really what the church is supposed to be. It's not the heart of a man. It's not the idea of a man. Listen, new life is not my idea. I argued against it. I said, I don't want to start a church. But finally, I just said, okay, whatever you want. Moses didn't want to go back to Egypt either. He argued with God. He argued with God, and he goes, I, 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 I can't talk. And God said, who made your mouth? Listen, it's okay to argue with God as long as at the end you surrender. How many of you have ever argued with God? Well, come on, don't lie now. Yeah. Because we don't think we're, we're competent, we don't think we have it, it scares us, it's bigger than we are. Listen, vision is always greater than you. Because what we do isn't because we're so wonderful, what we do is because he's so wonderful. He's the one that brings it all to pass. He just wants to know, are you available? And so all of this came out of watching people get involved, whether it's the feeding programs, medical clinics, building materials that, that we help with in NLCOM. But it's something that we've always endeavored to do as a church. It's wonderful to have the life of God in us, but it's so much better to not only have it in you, but have the life and the love of God flow out of you. See, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, not a prison for the Holy Ghost. And the world is, what's on the inside wants to come out. Amen. We, we were singing a song, I got peace like a river. I got joy like an ocean. You can't contain rivers. They flood. You can't contain an ocean. They're huge. And what we have is not to be contained. It's to be an influence into the world. That's what the church is. That's why we're here. We don't just in, attend a church. We belong to a church, and we have a purpose in that house. Matthew chapter 16, I want to take you on a progression of these six verses, which a lot of people really haven't seen. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? That is the single greatest question every man or woman on earth will have to answer. Who do you say that Jesus is? So who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. He says, Peter, that's revelation. You didn't get that because you're so smart you got that because it was revealed to you. That's revelation, a revealing, a seeing of what was previously unknown. My Father revealed this to you. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, revelation of who Jesus is is the beginning. But then after that, not only do we need to see who he is, but then he wants us to see how he sees us how we see him, and then a revelation of how he sees us because that's what builds a security. That's what builds a confidence and a peace and a faith in your life. It's not just that you see him clearly, but you know how he sees you. That stops the lies and, and the depressions and the heaviness and the discouragements from trying to overtake your life because you have the truth of how you're seen by him, not seen by man, not seen by your disappointments or failures or things where you've done wrong, but how does he see you? That's what brings you peace. I say unto you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, revelation 
brings you into a place of relationship. Your relationship with Jesus begins with the revelation that you have of who he is. And the strength of it continues when you understand not just how you see him, but how he sees you. I got a revelation, you know, after I got saved. Um, Shadi's best friend is the one that really helped lead me to the Lord and, and through her best friend. Her best friend did two wonderful things in my life. She introduced me to Jesus, and then she introduced me to Shadi, two people I've been serving for the last so many years. <laughs> and I got a revelation. I got a revelation that I was going to marry Shadi. I knew I was going to marry. I, I, man, I, I, saw the, I saw her heart for God. She has a passion for God. And I just thought, man, that's just one hot girl, too. So I, you know, in, I loved her heart, but it was in a good package. I'm just being honest. You know, Pearl was up here praying for you singles. Let me go back to that for a minute. This is important. How many of you know that there are two words that sound very similar? Complete and finished. You need to know the difference between when something's complete or when something's finished. When you marry the right person, you're complete. You marry the wrong person, you're finished. So <laughs> make sure you know the difference. You want to be complete. Right, all the single ladies, yeah, wherever you are, and the single guys. Ladies, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Let him find you. Don't settle. Brothers, open your eyes, too. So, anyway, anyway back to this. He said, and I will build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then he goes on and he says, and most people... They don't continue on with this, because, but it's so powerful because it, it's connected with the revealing of who Jesus is. And this, this goes from here to here so fast. He goes from the revealing of who Jesus is to Jesus says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm sure Peter's going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I just see who you are, and now you're talking about giving us the keys of heaven and binding and loosening and heaven and touching earth. Because you see, revelation brings in, you into a relationship, and relationship is what will take you into your purpose. And so Jesus goes from revelation to relationship to the church and the church and revealing purpose. That, and, and, and the Amplified Classic says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declared to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, declare unlawful on earth, must be what is already loosed in heaven. In other words, as I build this body of believers, as I bring this group of people together, you will become aware of heaven's will. And when you become aware of heaven's will, you can declare and stop things that ought not to be happening on the earth because since it's bound in heaven, I'm giving you the keys to stop it down here. And when you realize what heaven wants loosed and free and moving and operating and expanding, when you realize what heaven wants down here, then you can also pray and declare and loose things things down here. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It went from re revelation to relationship to this incredible purpose of the church and people being involved bringing change on earth. In six verses, it happened just that quick. You and I have a purpose together with heaven. Let me say that again. You're not just attending church today. It's far greater than that. We have a purpose in belonging to the body of Christ to touch our generation with the kingdom of God. The church he is building, a body of believers, we become aware of the will of heaven. And then we are part of bringing it to pass on the earth. Revelation, relationship and, pur and, and purpose. How we see him, how he sees us and the purpose that comes from that. And then what he is building together. Isaiah 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways, your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He says, look, heaven's up here, earth's down here. My ways, my thoughts are up here. But as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and do not return but water the earth, he says, rain and snow come down from heaven and it waters the earth. It has an effect on the earth and it brings forth the bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that proceeds out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish that which I send it forth to do. In other words, he said the word that comes from heaven will have an effect on the earth. See, heaven is wanting to touch earth. And there is an, and I don't want to use the word organization, but there is a body. There is a family called the church that represents heaven on earth that has authority of the keys of the kingdom of heaven to bring change on earth. And when you make yourself available and when you make a decision to get involved with the heart of God and the purposes of God, then you actually begin to live in your generation bringing change on earth because of what heaven wants to do. Think about it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, okay, pray this way. He, didn't, he said, no, he didn't teach them a prayer. He taught them how to pray. He yeah. didn't want them to just recite as fast as possible because you got in trouble. Our Father, which art in heaven, be in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you're going to pray, who are you talking to? My Father. You know, I've got to revelate. Having children and then having grandchildren. I had a revelation a number of years back, and it really transformed my prayer life. Because as a dad, I, I love my kids. As much as I wanted to knock them out a few times, as irritating as they have been, I love my kids. I love my daughter. I love my sons. I really love my grandkids. Oh, man. I have one more coming, too. I have a little boy coming. I'd do anything for them. I love my kids. As much as sometimes they irritate me, I still would do anything for them. If I had more money, I'd do more for them. I would. I really would. They need, if their car was broke down, I, if I had the money, I'd help them get a new car. I don't want to spoil them. I want them to have gratitude. I want them to have appreciation. I don't want to ruin them. But, but let me tell you, in my heart... I would do anything for them. And my grandkids? I come and sit on my lap. What do you want? And I'm just a natural dad. I'm just a natural father. I'm just a natural man. But our Father in heaven. And I got this revelation that when I pray, Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father. And so my prayer life was transformed, and, 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 I, and I walk. I, I take walks, and every, every day when I, well, I try to walk every day. And in my walk, Father, and I talk to my dad. Because I think if I had the capacity, what I would do for my sons, and I'm not as good and as perfect as he is, how does he love me? They would get, listen, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have my son crucified for sinners. And how he freely gave the best that heaven had to redeem us is a love beyond our comprehension. So I have this father, so when I pray, I just, just that, my father, and I, I can get lost in my father before I even go any further into the prayer, which is in heaven. Holy, majestic, wonderful, awesome. Magnificent is your name. Which name? Well, Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider. Jehovah Rapha, you're my healer. Jehovah Sid Canoe, you're my righteousness. You're my shepherd. You, you, this is, this, I, I mean, I could get lost from Father and to his name, and that could take me 30 minutes. It's not the repetition of words. It's the acknowledgement of who he is. Jesus said, pray this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed holy, to be praised, to be honored, to be magnified is your name. Your kingdom come, your... 
What did he say, pray? He said, I want you to pray that the will of God be done on as it is in. In other words, what's been loosed in heaven needs to be loosed in the earth. What's been bound in heaven needs to be bound in the earth. And there has to be a group, there has to be a body, there has to be a people that know what heaven's will is so they can stand for it and represent it and help bring it to pass and bring the kingdom into earth. That's the church. That's you and I. So we don't just attend church. We belong to a church. We're planted in a church. And we have a purpose as a church. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't seek after the things. Seek after God. God doesn't care about the things that you own. God's not caught up in, in you having things. He just doesn't want things to have you. He wants you to own the things. He doesn't want the things to own you. And if you'll seek him first, if you'll go after him first, then he'll add all the things to you because he knows that the, the joy of your heart, the delight of your heart, and the love of your heart is not the things, it's him. And so he'll add all the things to you. In the Amplified, it says, but first and most importantly, seek, aim, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness. His way of doing and being right. No, it doesn't just say seek ye first the kingdom of God. No, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his. In other words, there's a way to live. There is something that becomes alive on the inside of you. The, you receive the, the gift of righteousness when you're born again. So you need to walk it out. You, you need to walk and live with moral excellence and character and integrity. Why? Because we represent Jesus. Think about it. What, what he's doing in our lives, we have the ability to live and love in a way that the world does not have. We can, we can walk in love. Love is the most unselfish thing in the world. It's the greatest power in the world. It is the motivation for giving and loving and sacrifice. Love will cause you to sacrifice like nothing else. We don't gossip. We don't, have to, we don't have to be judgmental or critical. We don't have to be easily offended. And when people get around us, they wonder, how in the world can you be like that? How can you live that way? Well, because I have someone on the inside of me that's greater than anything that's out here in the world. It's the life of God. It's the love of God. And what happens is those who don't know God can come to know God because they know you. Because there's a reflection. There's a life that flows out of you. We're living, walking, breathing temples of the Holy Ghost. But most and first, but first and most importantly, seek, aim, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his ways of doing and being right. The attitude and character of God. Let God build this into you, and then all these things will be added. Go after the kingdom. Seek after the kingdom. Contend for the things of God. And when we do, see, when you seek the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is the rule, the reign, and the influence of heaven in our life. And when you have the rule and the reign of, and the influence of heaven in your life, it gives you the ability to overcome the things that would try to destroy you and steal from you. I, I made a list, and I had to cut it short because it just kept going on and on. And, and, and what happens is it's dangerous when I start writing messages that I get carried away, and, and, and they can go too long. And so I had to cut it short, but I'll give you the shorter version of my list. When we allow the rule and the reign of the kingdom, because you see, we, we, we have a revelation of who he is. We've entered into a, into a relationship with him, and we understand that we have a purpose that we're walking out together with Jesus. Because we love his church. We love what he loves. We love what he gave his life for. And when we seek first the kingdom of God, that influence in our life, it gives me the ability to have faith over doubt. To have prayer over, over fear, worry over worship, love over hate, joy over sorrow and peace over torment, comfort over pain, healing over sickness, forgiveness over bitterness, generosity over stinginess, self-control over anger, kindness over rudeness, wisdom over confusion. Now as I'm reading this, please don't elbow the person next to you like I'm talking to them, just let the Holy Ghost deal with them. Don't elbow them and go, did you get that one? You know, just 
<laughs> let, God, let God deal with him. Uh, wisdom over confusion, dignity over shame, value over feeling worthless, freedom over bondage, holiness over carnality, truth over lies, words of life over gossip and chismes, encouragement over discouragement, humility over pride, grace over self-confidence, integrity and character over compromise and selfishness. Restoration over regret, kindness and mercy over judgment and condemnation, hope over hopelessness, strength over weakness, courage over quitting, fruit of the spirit over the works of the flesh, God's will over my will, eternal perspectives over temporary values, purpose over emptiness, faithfulness over carelessness, conviction over casualness, passion over indifference, and gratitude over complaining. And these values, these values and principles and truths, they become ours and they get worked into our lives. And what happens? We become the light of the world. And when people get around us, they go, how do you do what you do? How can you not be offended? How can you... Listen, it takes the love of God. It takes the life of God that when someone slanders you and betrays you and takes advantage of you, and when you, when you would really rather slap them, you forgive them. Come on, anybody ever want to slap somebody? Oh, what holy people we have in here. You've never been irritated with anybody. You've never wanted to curse anybody. You've never wanted revenge. It Listen, it takes the love of God to walk in humility. It takes the love of God to forgive. It takes a revelation of God to want to give your money away. Listen, you just don't decide, hey, I just love giving my tithes. I just love giving generously in the office. No, no. It takes a revelation and a trust and a confidence in God. Because in and of ourselves, we're not this good. We don't do what, what we do because we're so wonderful. We do what we do because we have a new nature. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. And we are works of art. We are his workmanship recreated in Christ. Born anew that we may do those good works which he planned and prepared ahead of time for us. And so what we do is we step into it. But we're empowered on the inside. Why? Because we have a revel revelation. And we've stepped into a relationship. And in that relationship, we've made a decision. I'm going to walk in purpose. I'm going to carry a meaning. I'm going to bring a fulfillment into my life. I'm going to have a contentment that the world can't give me. Because no matter of gaining and getting is going to fulfill you. There will always be an emptiness. But when you walk in the will of God, there is a fullness and a completion. Listen. From the time I have began serving him and walking with him, I, it has been the greatest joy of my life. You know, in Sept is it September we're going to Brock Island? Yeah, we have a, a pastor's meeting on this little tiny island. We're going to Brock Island for a couple of days. I, I'm going to go a day earlier and pray and make sure everything's ready. But for almost 42 years ago, in a couple of months... It'll be 42 years ago, Shadi and I came to the Philippines. In my first year here, because the guy that I came to work with, he had a whole house in Brock Island. And back then, it was the most beautiful island. No tourist, no electricity, nobody was there. It was absolutely beautiful. No hotels. I remember the first guest house that you could stay at on Brock Island. It's called Summer Place. 50 pesos a night. And that included breakfast. Those days are gone forever. <laughs> it had a bed. It had a CR. It had a little uh, kerosene lantern. And breakfast was whatever the fishermen caught. You know, rice, egg, and you didn't know if it was going to be fish or squid or whatever. But it was always rice. I've eaten more rice and eggs than you can imagine. 50 pesos a night. How'd you like to go to Brock Island for 50 pesos a night? Yeah. Not in your dreams. <laughs> but I remember walking the beach at night. I said, I'm here. What do you want me to do? I'm here. What are we going to do? Two months from now, I'm going to be walking that beach again. And I'm going to be looking up at those stars and saying, <laughs> I'm still here. What do you want me to do? 
I have had the richest life imaginable. Because one of the things that makes you rich is not because of all that you get. It's because of how you position yourself to give. That's what enriches you. That's what brings a contentment and a joy. And that's what the church is all about. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they see your moral excellence, your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds, and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We want to re be a reflection of Him. That's what the church is supposed to be. Not a religious organization, but a reflection of the goodness and the love and the mercy and the kindness and the power of God. Ephesians 2.10 most of you know this is one of my favorite verses. In the Amplified, it says, We are his workmanship, his own master work, a work of art. Look at the person next to you say, You're just a work of art. If you're single and you're sitting next to a young lady, don't say anything more, just say that. If you said it right, maybe later on, you know, who knows? <laughs> His own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. Why? Well, we have revelation, we have a relationship, and guess what? We have purpose. We have purpose. Come on, everybody say purpose. Ready to be used, not taken advantage of. Ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the, living the, living the, what he prearranged and made ready for us to live. You see, a good life is not determined by the price of your car or the cost of your house. You know what a good life is? A good life is in that list I just read you. A good life is when you have faith over doubt, prayer over fear, worry over worship, love over hate, joy over sorrow, and I'm not going to go through them all again. But when you can walk in that, that's a good life. It's a full life. It's a rewarding life. Why? Because you're walking in revelation. You're standing in a relationship with the King of Heaven, the Prince of Peace, the King of Glory, and you're connected with a local body, His church. And there's a divine purpose where heaven is working in the earth and you're a part of it. There's no greater joy in life. It, I love being back here. Being in the States has frustrated me some. Because I meet so many believers, so many people that are Christians, love God, don't go to church. They don't have a pastor. They're not connected to a church. They're, they're, they're not involved in their give. They're, they're, there is no giving. There's no tithing. There's no offerings. They're not connected to any purpose. They love God. They're going to heaven. But as far as accomplishing anything to bring change into their generation, they have eternal life insurance, and that's all they have. They have revelation, and they have a relationship, but they're lacking this purpose, and they're lacking a fulfillment and a contentment and a joy, and, and, and they don't have the relationships, really, that when they need help, when they need prayer, to go to people, to, to pray with them, to pray for them, the relationships that build us up and encourage, because we are to encourage one another. We're stronger together. We're better together. We are a body. A good life is not just because you have a lot of money in the bank. I know people that are very, very wealthy, and they're miserable. I want to live the life that he's ordained for me. And I'll close with this because I'm already over time. Hebrews 10.23, Amplified Classic. Let us seize and hold fast and retain without hope, without wavering, the hope we cherish and confess. Let us seize... Grab a hold of it, hold tight, don't let go, don't waver. Because we come and we live in challenging times. The last two years have been some challenging times. And as we 
get closer and closer to the return of the Lord, there will be more challenging times. A year or so ago, uh, I know there was a watchword and there was a preaching about arise and shine. Man, arise and shine. Yeah, but, but that verse says when darkness covers the earth <laughs> and deep darkness the people, the glory of the Lord will arise and shine upon you. He says, listen, darkness is going to cover the earth. And deep darkness of people, in other words, it's not just darkness that's on the outside, it's a darkness that's gotten on the inside of them. A depression, an oppression, a suppression, and a weight, and a heaviness that is crushing people, and they have no life, no light, no joy, no peace. They have no inner substance that gives them the ability to stand. They've gone from hope to hopelessness. They have no encouragers around them. They've been isolated. The Bible says, in the last days, perilous times will come. As we come into the last days, we will not be affected by the perilous times because we will seize, we will hold fast and retain without wavering. Without wavering, the hope that we cherish, that we love. And we confess and we acknowledge it. Because he who promised is reliable and sure and faithful to his word. So this encouragement says, look, you lay hold of this word. You lay hold of the promises of God. You lay hold of the one who gave that promise because he who promised is faithful. And you don't waver. You cherish it. You persevere. You hold on to it. And then... Let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. And you lay hold of that word, you lay hold of that hope, you lay hold of that promise which carries the purpose that God has for you. But then part of that purpose is the people that you share life with. Let us consider and give attentive, continuous, not casual, continuous care to watching over one another, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. That's what Pastor Paul and Heidi were doing last week. What were they doing? They were trying to stimulate and, and incite you to love and helpful deeds and noble activities that in other people's pain, you can show up and you can be an answer to somebody's prayer let me and that is the heart of God then in someone's wound and pain and sorrow and sadness and they don't know what to do somebody shows up to help bring restoration to bring kindness to bring tenderness to bring hope that's Jesus that's the church that's what makes you rich that's what causes you to live at a whole different level in life not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some. I call in the people that used to be in the house. I know people are scared. I know people have lost loved ones. I've lost some very, very dear friends myself here in this house. The last time I was here, they were alive. And I've come home to the Philippines and, and they're not here anymore. It makes my heart sad because some of them I shared many, many years with. One lady in particular, 37 years, part of our life. I miss her. So I understand loss and concern, but we cannot allow worry or fear or, or what everybody is saying about the pandemic. Be, be wise. And I'm not trying to bring any kind of condemnation or shame on anybody, but we cannot allow the enemy to isolate us. We cannot allow a casualness to settle into our heart because we are the church and we've been called to come together. We've been called not to forsake the assembling together of the saints. We've been called to stand together in the house of God and worship. We've been called to be lovers and givers. And follow him because there's a purpose to be carried out in our generation. 
encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. Revelation of who he is, revelation of who you are to him will take you into this incredible, wonderful relationship. And that relationship will give you a strength and cause you to walk in a purpose. And God will do things with your life you never imagined. He's done things with my life so far, so far beyond my imagination. I'm not this good. What he has done, because I just said, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. And in the middle of my weakness, his grace has come in and given me ability far above and beyond my own. Don't limit what God can do in and with and through you because you can't figure it out in your own head. Get a revelation of who he is to you. Get an understanding of who you are to him. And as you trust in that relationship, you'll stack, step into a purpose that will cause your life to be full. And as you get planted in the house, as you get planted in the body, you make yourself available. All of us together, we can take what heaven wants done and bring it into the earth, and we can touch our generation for Jesus. Amen? Father, I thank you for this generation, especially all the young people. Of course, I, I, I love the older people too, me being one of them. But I speak into this younger generation. Let the voice of the Lord be clear. For hearts to be tender and available and not fear. For the will of the Lord to be revealed. Fill them. Fill us all. Fill us all with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that every single one of us has a walk worthy of you, fully pleasing you, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Thank you, Father, for these words I've shared tonight. Let them have an effect on the hearts of every man and woman here. Thank you for new life. Thank you for this house. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your people that make so much available. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.